Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we're going to be talking about jig fishing. We are going to talk about everything jig fishing. From the jigs, to the trailers, to the rods, the reels, the where, the how, all of it. This is going to be another seminar style video. We're really going to dig in deep, cover a lot of gear. We'll put links to everything in the video description so that you guys don't have to try and keep track of it while I'm running through it. Uh, and then we've got Tim back here actually throwing the jig while I'm explaining what's going on. So to start off, I think we're going to talk about the different jig styles to begin. Because this is such a huge, huge category. There are all different kinds of jigs on the market, different head shapes. They're all for different things. And it's such a wide range. I mean, there may not be a broader topic. That didn't take long. There may not be a broader topic in bass fishing than jig fishing because you can throw a little tiny jig all the way up to a monster punch jig. So, little guy, yep. let's run from one end of the spectrum to the other. Right off the bat, you got finesse jigs. Those are your little tiny, tiny jigs, typically ball heads, but you've also got finesse pitching jigs, two different styles. Uh, those are going to be a lot of the time your summer baits that's where a guy's really desperately trying to get that bite uh, you could throw them around docks a lot that's really where they shine those finesse jigs what's nice about them is that you can really downsize your gear it's hard to see in a package but they've got a very small hook compared to the other jigs typically lighter wire uh, and you can throw it on a lot lighter gear to catch finicky fish but you still have that jig profile, so you're typically upsizing your catch. If your fish get a little strange in summer, if they really pull up under the docks, that finesse jig can be a killer. Stepping up from that, you get to the football jigs. And this is just in order of how I rank them in my mind. Uh, you've got a finesse football. Let's see if I've got one tied on, maybe? I do, I've got one tied on. Finesse football. So you got that football profile, and then you've got a fairly light hook. So same concept, you can get away with throwing it on lighter gear. Uh, the benefits of the football jig, there's actually quite a few. If you have a, a lake with a muddy bottom, kind of puffing a football along the bottom and puffing up that mud. Are you catching fish again? Yeah, but I need another trailer. Man, he's tearing them up. So dragging that football in the mud, puffing that mud up is a very unique look that we don't see a lot of people do and it can be deadly. Another benefit of footballs though, is that in rock, they hang up a lot because it is such a broad head, but because it's so broad, they hang up, but they don't really get stuck. You can pop them and get them out. So they hang up a lot, but you don't break them off very much which is a really nice bonus. But again, that finesse hook, you're able to go to lighter lines. So I typically throw the finesse football in the wintertime. Think smallmouth, spotted bass, cold water largemouth. That's where that one shines for me. Next, you've got the traditional skirted football. Still a football head, all the same rules apply, but a much stronger hook. That's going to be your summertime football. That's the one or a big fish bait. Even in cold water, if you're getting big ones, that's a good option. But that stronger hook, in summertime, you use that heavy football and you can be aggressive. You can pop it and rip it, really work that bait because it is a heavy head. You could throw it in, you know, three eighths, half, three quarter ounce, those heavier sizes really get aggressive with your technique, uh, but still have a stout hook to back it up. Great option. Next is gonna be your pitching jigs. Um, I need that jig. Tim loses, I need his jig. It's got a different trailer on it. Can you cut it? That's all right. No more beavers. All right, the pitching jig is more of an arky style head. So a rounded head all the way around kind of halfway between a football and a flipping jig, and a pretty stout hook. You can see it does catch fish. That pitching head, if I could only have one jig, no doubt that's my jig, a pitching jig. 
uh, three eighths, half ounce, three quarter, all great sizes for different things. I really like that three quarter because I get great contact with the bottom. I can use it to flip cover. It's not perfect for it, but it'll do it. I can use it to fish rock. It's not perfect for it, but it comes through it. It'll come through wood. It'll come through grass. It works on mud. There is not a more universal head than that pitching head. And then again, paired with a stouter hook, it's a great jig year round. You can have that back if you want. All right, now I need the other one. Sorry, bud. Boy, we are not coordinating today. Thank you. This guy is a casting jig. What's the difference, right? We cast all jigs. Well, a casting jig is typically going to be an arky style head again, but with a much lighter hook. So you can fire long distance. It's very weight forward, more so than a true arky. So you can really get distance out of it. Uh, and then because it is a little bit lighter wire hook, you get good penetration way out there. Uh, so you don't have to throw it on the biggest gear. You can still get a great hookup but it's solid enough to get those big fish. The casting jig is a, a growing segment of the market. Uh, they really weren't even that popular just a few years ago, but it again, right next to that pitching jig. For me, a pitching jig is the heavier end of the spectrum, the casting jig, the lighter end, if I wanna go to lighter line, lighter rods, but those two really cover it well. Both great, great choices. And again, I'm just flying through this stuff right now. We're gonna get to colors and weights and all those things here shortly. Where do we go from there? Flipping, that's what's left. Flipping heads, they're gonna vary brand to brand. And as you guys, I'm sure know if you followed us at all over the years, we lean towards Dirty Jigs. We use a ton of their product. I've, I've just used Dirty Jigs for so long. I'm very confident in the hooks, very confident in my colors. That's what I use. But if you use another brand, you can still take this exact information and apply it to your brand when you're looking at head shapes, trying to choose the right one for you. The flipping head is typically going to be a pointed head. How pointed varies brand to brand. But the benefit of that pointed head is that it comes through grass, through toolies, through cattails extremely well because that head will come through first and then it kind of parts the cover and makes way for the jig to follow through. The downside of a flipping head is that when you get into a rocky situation, exact same thing, that pointed head is gonna come right in there and stick and there is no getting it out. So the flipping style jig head really suffers in rock, but it's fantastic in grass and you know, sparse vegetation all the way up to thick, heavy cover. Um, you can use a heavy flipping jig or transition to a punching jig for true heavy cover flipping and punching. But even in the sparse stuff, it really shines. And then again, it's got a really, really heavy hook on it. So you have no worries there. Uh, this is typically a braid jig, you know, braid to a liter or heavy, heavy fluorocarbon. Uh, or straight braid when you start flipping and punching with it in that overhead vegetation. So that's just a rundown of the, the different styles. Uh, now trailers, how to pair with them. There are really only a few different styles of trailer out there. You've essentially got dead action, and we've talked about this before, dead action trailers like the Sweet Beaver. They basically do nothing, but it's a good profile. It looks good on the jig. It's a really nice action. When they hit bottom, if you're hopping it, those claws just kind of sit there and open and close. That's all they do. But it looks good and I'll tell you what, it gets bit. That is hands down one of my favorite trailers. Your second option is going to be double tail grubs. And there's different brands making them. You throw a lot of the Dry Creek, a lot of Yamamoto, four inch and five inch. Uh, but that double tail grub is a great bait because you get good action in the summertime, but in winter it becomes critical because in winter, as water gets cold, these plastics get more rigid. 
It won't flow as much in the water. And a lot of baits will kind of get a dead action when you don't want it. But a double tail grub is so thin, uh, at least these two brands, the ones we use, are so thin that when you fish them even in cold water, they still get good flutter, good movement. Uh, so those are a fantastic choice year round. Then your third style is gonna be those true, wide action, heavy movement. Uh, you know, like the pack of chunk or a pack of craw. Uh, I might even have that sitting here. Yeah, there's a pack of slim. The paca is kind of the first bait that I remember that got that really erratic action. Uh, rage baits are gonna fall into that same category. The, like the rage craw uh, or the rage bug. Those are both baits. They're gonna have that wider, more aggressive action that you're gonna want in that warmer water. And you know what, I guess there is a fourth category and that's pork. Um, pork is kind of a dying category and I, I tend to shy away from talking about it because it's so hard to get anymore. Um, but for those of you that have been with us for years, you know there is a place for fishing pork if you can still get your hands on it. I've got a giant backstock at the house so I never run out. Uh, but pork in cold water is deadly effective. But we'll kind of leave it at that because it's gotten so hard to get your hands on anymore. Uh, but now that, that double tail grub still has good action in that cold water and I, I think that's your best transition uh, with pork getting more difficult to get. Now colors. Let's talk about colors on the jig trailers before we talk about colors on the jigs themselves. Uh, don't worry about making a match. You know, it's, it's great when they all work together and they look nice, it's pretty, but you don't have to do that. You can, you can take a jig that's a really natural color, like it's super matte brown. That's the color I designed with Dirty Jigs years ago. It's kind of a cinnamon purple. And I've got it paired up here with a cinnamon purple trailer. But if you wanna branch out, if you wanna see what's going on with the bite, don't be afraid to throw black and blue on there or a green pumpkin on there. The accents, they work together. And by, by changing up your trailer and your jig color separate of each other, you can carry a lot less product in the boat. You know, you don't need 10 colors of jig and 15 colors of trailer. If you've got three, four, five jig trailers and three, four, five jigs, and you can mix and match them, you've got the entire gamut colored, uh, covered, excuse me. Keep it really, really simple with your colors. With my trailers, I'm typically carrying something in the blacks, black and blue, black and red, uh, a lot of black and blue. But black and blue is a color, well, I'm gonna come back to that when I talk jigs actually, but it's a color that uh, I try to mute a little bit, but black and blue is a good color. Green pumpkin is a really good color. Cinnamon is a really good color. Uh, those are colors that will go with everything and really can accent a lot of different jigs so you don't have to carry a lot of colors. Now jig color, same deal. You wanna keep it simple. In the summertime, we mix in some red out here, but for the most part, we're throwing green pumpkin. Green pumpkin brown, green pumpkin black, uh, but it doesn't hurt to have black and blue, obviously the number one jig color in the world. Uh, that cinnamon purple is an absolutely deadly color, especially in colder water. And then anything in that green pumpkin realm. I throw, like I said, green pumpkin brown, green pumpkin, green pumpkin, uh, brown on brown, those are just really natural, basic tones. And then if I wanna mix them up, yeah, there it is, natural as can be. Green pumpkin on brown, and I spiked my braid. Excuse me for a moment. So green pumpkin on brown with a natural colored trailer to match. But if I really wanna change the profile of that jig, if I throw a black and blue trailer on there, all of a sudden I've got a really bold, really standout color that will excel in just about any watercolor and I didn't have to change my jig. Now, black and blue. 
Hands down, it's the number one color in all of jig fishing nationwide. But for whatever reason, that bold, bold blue sometimes throws me off, especially in clear water. So just a, a color you may want to check out is a Dirty Jigs color. It's called Hematoma. And I ordered these for the first time late winter this year. Uh, I was throwing black and blue. I ran out of a color. I needed to order some more and I thought I'd branch out. Hematoma is almost a flat black jig, but when I turn it, I get blue pearlescence. So I get that black blue profile without that aggressive bright blue. And if I want that aggressive color, I put a blue trailer on there. But if I don't, if I want to throw a green pumpkin on here, that blue almost disappears and I have a black green pumpkin jig. If I throw brown on there, it's a black and brown jig. But if I do throw that bright blue out, it pops the color out of that skirt and it's a bold black and blue jig. That is a color worth checking out if you're a big black and blue guy, or even if you're not, if you want a color that will do a lot of different things, that's a really good choice. Now, where do you throw these things? And then we're gonna come back to gear. Where do you throw jigs? Man, they work everywhere. Uh, it's summertime right now while we're sitting down filming this, about to transition into fall. So we're still flipping them in the grass right now, throwing them out on the rock. Tim's throwing up to grass edges here and then working it down. There's pretty aggressive rock as you start working down the bank here. And then out off the back of this, there's some breaks. So he's fishing everything from grass to rock while I'm sitting here talking to you guys about this. Those are great places to throw it. The jig will also do really well on docks because it skips very, very well because the, the head of the jig in particular, as long as you don't have a flipping style head, a flipping head will bite a little bit, but if you've got a pitching style head where it's that rounded head, the head wants to skip. And then with that trailer and the skirt material on it, it just sort of flows. It'll skip really well. So you can get it way back under docks where it's hard to get other baits. Fish is extremely well. You can take it offshore and fish ledges and humps. Very, very universal bait. And then of course you can swim a jig. And don't think that I've ignored that. It's just that we've already done a really in-depth video on swimming a jig. So if you haven't seen that, Tim will give you guys a link to that video. Uh, it's a full in-depth video, everything you need to know about swimming a jig. And that's why I'm completely skipping over it right now. The other thing I'm completely skipping over is modifying these jigs. Everything from trimming skirts to cutting back weed guards. Same thing, we have an incredibly in-depth video on how to do that. How to use thinning shears to make a jig look more beat up. Because believe it or not, more often than not, a beat up jig absolutely outshines a brand new jig. So there are some things that you can do to really change the look of your jig out of the package but again, we've already got a video on that. So you're either gonna see a link pop up here or down in the video description, we'll give you a link to both of those videos as well. That's why we're jumping past that. Going back to where you're gonna throw them, everything from rock to grass to mud, everywhere in between. Guys that have latched onto a jig think it is the most universal bait there is. Guys that have yet to get bit think it is the most difficult bait in the world to get a bite on. It's just a confidence thing. It typically gets less bites than a Texas rig, but much bigger bites. It'll still catch little fish, but it will catch monsters. That's one of the beauties of throwing a jig is that you're still covering water, you're still catching fish. If I hop in front of a two pounder, he's probably going to eat it. If I hop in front of a 12 pounder, she's probably going to eat it. And there's not a lot of baits that will catch little fish and big fish, right? If you're throwing a swim bait, you're eliminating 90% of your bites. If you're throwing a drop shot, you're eliminating 90% of your giant bites. But the jig is that crossover bait. It'll get a few less bites than the worm or the Texas rig, but it will get the right bites and it will get a lot of bites. So that, that is the key to the jig. Now retrieves vary, and I'm not sure what Tim's been doing behind me, 
Um, but you can do everything from just dragging a jig right on bottom. Just barely drag it, just creeping it along. You can even pull it behind the boat. When you've got really cold water, just dragging a jig is deadly. I shake a jig a lot. Uh, we recently did a summer jig fishing video. I talked about using a double hop. The reason why is if you watch a crawdad in the water, when they're ready to make a move, they typically pop up and then dart away. Pop up, dart away. That's how they move. So when I work a jig, I use a, a double hop. Reel down, double hop. It pops up and then takes off and then settles back down. Hops up, takes off. And that's my favorite way to work a jig, that quick double hop. You can also do what's called stroking a jig, where you take a heavy jig, a three quarter or a one ounce. You fire it out and you let it hit bottom and use a full, either single pump or full double pump. When you pop it hard, pop, pop, and then you let it fall on a semi-slack line. Pop, pop, semi-slack. It's a full reaction bite. Works incredibly well in warm water on ledges. If the fish are schooling on rock breaks, that's the place to really be ripping that jig hard. It'll crush them. All across the south, if you're on one of those river fisheries where they're ledge fishing, ripping that jig up can get monster, monster bites. But again, you can do almost anything with a jig. Throw it to a piling, let it fall, shake it on the bottom, flip to the next piling, shake it on the bottom, to dragging it behind the boat, it all works. Gear. You guys know, we say this all the time, we primarily use braid to leader. I use almost all braid to leader. Typically with a jig, this is a, a bigger fish technique. We're gonna use 50 to 65 pound braid, and then we're going to tie a 15 to 20 pound leader most of the time. That's gonna cover me spring through fall. Now, if I'm pitching or true flipping, I'm gonna go straight braid. Winter time, we're gonna to go to lighter line. You can go to 30 pound braid to a 15 or 12 or even 10 pound leader, especially if you're going to those finesse jigs, you can get away with that much lighter line and a much lighter rod. But typically 50 to 65 pound braid with 15 to 20 pound leader. Uh, I use a lot of mono and I think guys are still surprised by that, but in most fisheries, they're not clear enough for me to think that fluoro makes that vast of a difference. So I use a lot of mono and I typically just go a little bit smaller diameter, or excuse me, a little bit smaller line size. So I might throw a 12 where I would have thrown 15 in fluoro or 15 where I would have thrown 17 or 20 in fluoro uh, to kind of help with that visibility. But mono is such a good shock absorber when you're jig fishing. So I'll run a, six to ten foot leader on the end of my braid to that jig so when i get those bites i still get great contact i feel bottom i feel the bites but when i hammer them i've got some give there a little bit of stretch so that i don't bend hooks and i don't break line if you are a fluoro guy typically 15 to 20 pounds is where you're going to be uh, this summer i was experimenting with some micro guide rods so i threw a lot of assassin in 15 and 20 pound Sunline Assassin. Uh, had really, really good results with that. So don't be afraid to throw it on either one, but for the most part, we throw it on braid. Now the rods, I've talked a ton in the past about rods. I'm just as opinionated today as I was back then. I believe that the bulk of the industry is screwing up on the style of jig rods that they're building. Extra fast rods, are not the answer for jig fishing, in my opinion. Uh, I think you want a more moderate rod. Now, company to company, some brands are going to say that it's an extra fast, but when you pick it up, it's not. And others are gonna say that it's moderate, and you pick it up and it's not, it's clearly fast. But those more moderate, those little bit slower rods are killers for jigs. That braid's a little screwed up, sorry about that wind picked up this little light. So rods. Sorry about that. That braid's a little screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the rods. Typically gonna go a little bit long. Something in the seven foot two to seven foot eight 
range is where I'm gonna go with that jig rod. Don't have to be brand specific. Down in the video description, I'm gonna give you links to some of my favorite jig rods, maybe one of Tim's favorite jig rods, but something that 7278, the reason for that longer rod is so that when you hit them, you load up more of that rod. You want as much rod as possible bowing on that fish so that when they come up and they shake their head, because oftentimes the jig you're using heavier weights, right? Half ounce, three quarter ounce, that's a lot of weight. And you've got a weed guard there helping hold that hook in and that does a lot for you, but it's not perfect. When you have three quarters of an ounce hanging on one hook point in a fish's mouth, especially if you've got a strong hook set and you really rip a hole, if you go slack on them at all, it's just gonna fall right out of that hole. So by going to a more moderate rod, when you hit them and you load up that rod, when they head shake, they can't unload it. The head shake is what kills you. If you're throwing an extra fast rod and a big one is shaking her head, she's got those big wide shakes, between shakes, the rod is unloading and loading, unloading and loading. You get them? Yeah. Nice. That'll kill you. That's where those fish come off. By going to a softer rod or a more limber rod, you get more rod involved. And even though as she's shaking, it's unloading, it never gets all the way unloaded. There's always some pressure keeping that hook in there. That's a better fish. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We got problems. High sticking them. I ain't high sticking. But those rods, that more limber tip, it makes a big difference and it will keep those fish pegged quite a bit better. Well, I guess on that note, we'll wrap this one up. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you a new rod, I guess. I guess so, man. So, oh, actually, I think you might owe you a new rod. Sorry, buddy. Figured. But seriously, guys, those longer rods make a big difference. Adjusting the size of the hook and the weight of the jig goes a long, long ways in keeping those fish pinned and you can adjust to changing water conditions throughout the year. I hope that helps guys. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. If you've got questions, put them down in that video description. We'll be happy to answer them for you. Enjoy that jig fishing throughout the rest of the year and we'll talk to you soon.